Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. I'm Zach Peterson. I'm a technical consultant with Altium and today we're going to talk about digital signal bandwidth. So what is the digital signal bandwidth? Well, if you remember your math classes, you'll probably remember that the bandwidth of a digital signal is technically infinite, which is true. Now, in a practical sense, when you're designing a high-speed channel or you're working with analog signals, you need to cut the bandwidth off somewhere. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna focus on digital signals and some practical implications of real transmission lines on a PCB. So let's get started. This whole topic came up because we got a viewer question and we love getting your questions. So please put your questions in the comments. We'll do our best to get to them and make new content as they come up. Baron is me asked, what I'm trying to determine is if I have a TR rise time, up to which frequency should I include in my analysis? I need to stop somewhere, right? Baron is me is correct. You need to cut off the frequency content somewhere, and that's what's gonna define your relevant bandwidth for your digital signal. So what I wanna do now is look at some typical definitions that are used to define digital signal bandwidth, and then I'll show you some practical examples that illustrate why you need to consider this in transmission line design. And we won't get too much into the math because it is a mathematically complex topic, but I'll actually show you an example of what a digital signal looks like in a very high-speed channel. If you Remember your math classes, as I said, you will remember that if I have a graph in time for a square wave, let's just say something like this, and from here to here is my period, I can define a lowest order frequency associated with this period, F equals one over T. So this is my first frequency that I can use to build a Fourier series that represents this digital signal. So you can find a good tutorial of this uh, on Wikipedia and they'll actually go through and derive it. I'm not gonna go through the full derivation because we'd be here forever doing that. So I'm just gonna show you the result. Essentially what the result is that if I add up this sine wave and I add up this sine wave and I just keep adding up higher and higher odd harmonics of sine waves. Eventually I can add up enough sine waves with the right amplitudes and I can reconstruct this square wave that I have on the board. So here this first one that I drew, this is the first harmonic that has this frequency. And then here we have a third harmonic. And I can continue drawing, you know, the fifth harmonic, the seventh harmonic. So this is one of the ways that some people will use to actually choose a cutoff for their bandwidth, for their frequency content in their signal. So again, let's say that this is, um, I'll just throw out a number here. Let's just say that this is uh, 100 nanoseconds, okay? So that means that this F would be 10 megahertz. So that means third order or the third harmonic would be 30 megahertz, the fifth would be 50 megahertz and so on and so forth. Sometimes what you'll see is people advocating the use of the fifth harmonic as the cutoff for a digital signal. So that would mean that if I have this signal with a period or a repetition period of 100 nanoseconds, that would mean that my bandwidth should be 50 megahertz. Frankly, I think that explanation is total BS. That is totally arbitrary, okay? I could just as well say that, well, I, you know, I should cut it off at the seventh. Why not at the ninth harmonic? Why not at the 11th harmonic? The fifth harmonic doesn't have any better justification than the seventh or the ninth harmonic, and there's a few reasons for that. Number one, the frequency content or the, the uh, amplitudes associated with these different frequencies will change if I include a rise time here for this portion of the signal, okay? So remember, this rise time is what determines where the frequency content is concentrated in the frequency domain. So this rise time is actually important. Now, in general, it is correct that you need more bandwidth, meaning you will have a higher limit on your bandwidth if this time is compressed. Because let's say that I make this as small as you know, one nanosecond instead of 100 nanoseconds. Well, I certainly couldn't have a, you know, five nanosecond rise time here. 
it wouldn't fit in this one nanosecond window, obviously. If I make this one nanosecond, this makes my F you know, one gigahertz, and then my fifth, uh, then my fifth harmonic would be five gigahertz. However, we still have the problem where the fifth harmonic is just as arbitrary as the seventh or the ninth or even the third harmonic. So cutting off based on harmonics, I have always said is totally meaningless and arbitrary. So let's look at another definition for bandwidth, okay? So I'm gonna redraw my digital signal here in the time domain, and I'm gonna include the rise time just for a moment and the fall time, okay? So this is my typical digital signal and I'm gonna mark off the you know 10% and the 90% correspondence for the, uh, for the rise, the signal level. So if this is my rise time, this quantity here, this rise time is actually going to limit the, uh, my ability to actually reproduce this signal when I measure it. So this is something that I brought up in a previous video where you will sometimes see the bandwidth quoted as BW equals 0 0.35 divided by T sub R, this rise time, this 90-10 rise time. So this is usually what's quoted as kind of your bare minimum man, uh, bandwidth if you were going to take a scope like an oscilloscope and actually measure this signal in the time domain. This bandwidth value corresponds to a specific type of oscilloscope. And it's a scope that has only a first order input filter or behaves as a first order input filter um, on the input stage of the scope when you connect a probe to it and actually try and take a measurement of this signal in the time domain. The input stage of an oscilloscope can actually behave more like a higher order filter. So it can be say a fourth order or an eighth order filter. And so what that means is basically you need much more bandwidth than this. Now uh, another comment from uh, on that earlier video was that instead of 0.35 you need 0 0.5, about 0 0.5. That uh, comment was actually citing Howard Johnson. And Howard Johnson is technically correct. You do need more bandwidth than just the 0 0.35, but you couldn't need even more bandwidth than that. And so it really depends on the input stage of your oscilloscope that you would want to use to measure this digital signal. Now, if you were to say, use a scope with insufficient bandwidth, what you would end up seeing is you would end up seeing some non-causal artifacts, so ringing, on these different edges of this signal. And you would even see ringing before the signal makes its transition. So essentially the scope has to know that this signal is about to transition and then it would reproduce this ringing. Well, these artifacts come from the way that a scope reproduces a signal readout when it actually takes a measurement. And if you have insufficient bandwidth, then what will happen is it will not be adding up enough frequency components to display the true shape of the signal. And you will have these artifacts that appear on these different falling and rising edges. When you see this type of expression, like 0.5 or you know even like 0.8 or something really high like this, um, sometimes you'll just even see, just go all the way, just go to one over the rise time. Sometimes you'll even see this. What they're saying is they're actually referring to the bandwidth needed to measure this with an oscilloscope. Now you can take the you know logical analog of that and say, well, you know, my receiver in my high speed channel needs to measure this signal and be able to reproduce it in order to register a logic state. And that's not really true. All the receiver needs to do is just to be able to distinguish that this level is above a certain threshold to turn on the, the logic circuit that is in the receiver. It doesn't really care about perfectly reproducing this rising edge or this falling edge. It's just being making sure that you can actually register this signal. So now what I wanna do is look at a third way to talk about bandwidth in a digital signal. And I think this is really the, in my opinion, it is one of the best ways to talk about bandwidth because it considers the effects of the channel and not necessarily the effects of trying to take a measurement, which is usually the way that people will try and talk about a, the bandwidth of a digital signal. Instead of drawing out a digital signal uh, waveform here, what I actually wanna draw out is the transfer function H for a transmission line in the frequency domain. And here I'm considering 
a terminated transmission line that has some load capacitance at the load end. So meaning that I have a driver and it's connected to a receiver, but here at the input of the receiver, there is some capacitance back to GND. And so what that does is it causes your uh, transfer function to appear like a low pass filter. So the transfer function of this transmission line to appear like a low pass filter, okay? So there's some attenuation here as frequency steadily increases. Um, this is due to the propagation constant. And you remember, the propagation constant has some losses in it that are associated with the dielectric constant, things like skin effect, things like copper roughness. And then it starts to roll off. And this roll off is in part due to this uh, load capacitance here at the receiver. So the load capacitance is one of the factors that is responsible for limiting the bandwidth of your channel and limiting what the receiver can reliably detect. So you could use as a limit on your bandwidth something like this 3 dB roll off point. So if you're familiar with low pass filters, you can draw these two lines here and you can see where the frequency is, where they intersect, and you could use this as a cutoff point. You could also look at, as I said, an F3 dB point. So the 3 dB reduction point as you reach this roll off. This is not a totally accurate uh, dis you know, display of the, uh, the transfer function for a transmission line. Again, there are a number of factors that play in here to give it this shape. The point is that a transmission line, because there is some load capacitance at the end that shunts back to ground at the input of the receiver, it does behave something like a low pass filter. And so you can actually calculate what the input impedance is for this uh, transmission line uh, at the input of the receiver when there is this load capacitance. So usually we don't really worry about the load capacitance until we need to work at really high frequencies. So this load capacitance can be somewhere in the area of uh, one picofarad. I'm a physicist, so I'm used to writing writing everything in scientific notation. This is uh, normally stated in a data sheet uh, for the component, and you should look at the data sheet if you want to know what the typical load capacitance is. It's all based on the internal structure of the receiver component, and specifically its input stage where the transmission line connects to the input on the receiver. So what I want to look at now is uh, what the frequency content of an example high-speed digital signal is, and then we want to look at how to consider that in the impedance and what a real impedance curve might look like. Now, when I say a real impedance curve, I don't mean literally a measured impedance curve. What I'm gonna show is actually a simulated impedance curve, but it doesn't take into account all of the effects that happen in the high-speed channel. Um, so here, what I'm looking at on screen uh, is a uh, excerpt from uh, this design con paper that I've cited down at the bottom. And I think this is a really great design con paper because it really nicely shows some of the uh, effects that you might see see uh, when you're operating at this 6 to 112 gigabit per second uh, uh, data rate range. Um, so it is definitely high speed design, especially when you consider these data rates. And um, it's also very instructive for teaching some of the concepts behind uh, the ways to think about high speed signals and what the bandwidth is. So here in this right graph, what you're looking at is a power spectral density for this bit stream here that's in, uh, in red on the left uh, side of this image. If you look at the right side, you can see um, immediately, or you should be able to see immediately, that uh, the bandwidth spans all the way from zero, so DC, um, all the way out here to five times 10 to the 11th hertz. So that's 500 gigahertz. So that's huge. We're bordering on terahertz frequencies, which is a very fun area of electronics. We have to ask the question again, well, what's the, what's the relevant bandwidth for this signal? So there are a number of ways to analyze this. Okay. So if you look at just one over the rise time, you can see it's called out right here. Here for this, uh, for this uh, bit stream, the rise time is four picoseconds. So if I just take one divided by the rise time, I get 250 gigahertz. So that's a lot of bandwidth. With. And you can actually see here the power spectrum drops below about negative 50 dB when you get down to this level. That's a very big drop off. So remember, 
one, uh, 10 dB is one order of magnitude. So that's five orders of magnitude lower than what the power spectral density is uh, near DC. So that's really big drop off uh, at that level of bandwidth. If we go to a calculator here real quick, and here you can just see I've calculated 0 0.35 times 250. So that's the lower end of the bandwidth that's usually cited when talking about digital signals, um, you get 87.5. So that's 87.5 gigahertz. So that's way back here on this left side. So you can see here, we're, we're not even down to this uh, second valley here in this power spectral density. This is where we get to the, uh, the another way to uh, talk about the bandwidth of a digital signal. Bandwidth is sometimes talked about in terms of the Nyquist frequency. This Nyquist frequency can also be used as a measure of bandwidth. So here we're dealing with 112 gigabits per second uh, signaling with PAM4. So PAM4 uses four signals levels. The bandwidth can be calculated from the uh, from the data rate just by taking the data rate and dividing it by the number of signal levels. So in this case if we were dealing with a binary bit stream we would take our 112 giga since gigabits per second we're dealing with gigahertz divided by two that would get us to 56 gigahertz. So that's the bandwidth for each symbol. However, we're dealing with four signal levels in this bit stream here that I've shown on the screen. And so that would get us down to 28 gigahertz for our Nyquist, okay? So sometimes if you are looking at uh, like S-parameter simulations, um, I've, I've done this with someone from ANSYS on, on a presentation that we worked on. The simulations that he was doing and he was looking at, they were only looking up to the Nyquist frequency and using that as a measure of signal integrity in a channel. So once dips were getting, or dips in the uh, S-parameters and the insertion loss were getting too low before the Nyquist frequency, we were saying, okay, this channel may need to be redesigned. So the Nyquist frequency can be used as one measure of uh, the bandwidth that you need to have in a channel in order to properly receive and interpret a digital signal that is in that channel. So the reason this is important, uh, I'm showing another graph here. Uh, this graph shows the uh, impedance uh, or the simulated impedance for a number of, of different uh, transmission lines uh, that I've simulated. What I'm showing here on this graph here with the purple curve. So this is a real part of the impedance. And as you can see, there's also imaginary parts of this impedance, okay? So this purple curve goes with this dark blue curve. and because of the uh, the losses that exist in a channel uh, or the losses that exist on a transmission line for the reasons that we've you know discussed in this video and other videos there will actually be an imaginary component in your impedance spectrum and you can see that the impedance is not perfectly flat the impedance is actually uh, changing over this entire bandwidth now if you do your design right what you'll notice here is it actually only varies by you know about uh, 0.2 ohm so that's really good that's within one so that's a really good design. What uh, the typical transmission line theory tells you is that when you don't have any losses, you would just have this flat red curve here. And so this flat red curve just tells you, hey, there's, you know, it's set at 50 ohms, uh, slightly below 50 ohms. So we can account for this very uh, small amount of imaginary component, which inevitably trends towards zero once we get to really high frequencies. So you'll notice the frequency scale here is going all the way out to 10 gigahertz. This is one of the uh, graphs that I show in my PCB West presentation for this year. You can go into my channel and watch it. Um, there's other uh, articles that I've written about this. And so I'll describe kind of these results in more details in some upcoming articles on Altium's blog. Um, but the point of this graph is to show you that your impedance uh, does have some variation in it across the entire bandwidth of your digital signal. And so your digital signal we'll see slightly different impedances depending on which portion of the frequency content we're talking about in the digital signal. Hopefully this answers some questions or maybe even spawns some new questions about what is the bandwidth of a digital signal. Just remember, technically it's infinite based on whether you're transmitting the, si the signal through a channel and you want it to be detected by a receiver or based on whether you want to measure the signal, you might have different needs for your bandwidth. Now, if you're looking for the best routing tools and the best layout tools to route your high-speed digital channels and to ensure that you accurately calculate impedance and take account of all the possible effects that can limit bandwidth in your system, go check out Altium Designer. The Layer Stack Manager includes a 2D field solver that very easily and very quickly calculates your impedance and your propagation delay 
in your high speed digital channels, including copper roughness, and it gives you very accurate results and it helps you ensure that you're routing everything correctly and obeying your impedance targets. Thanks for watching everybody and please hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more of these videos and don't forget to call your fabricator.